My husband and I have a five-month-old daughter, and he was the one who unfortunately got slammed with postpartum symptoms. He has severe postpartum anxiety, and he's in therapy for it. But it's been a bit of an adjustment for me. Nothing went as planned. I realize you can hardly plan most things and have them work out exactly as you planned when you become a parent. But some things... I don't know. I made an absolutely gorgeous nursery, with everything color-coordinated. I bought a really expensive baby monitor, etc., and my husband refuses to let the baby sleep in there because of his anxiety. Not even for naps. He will 100% wake her up and bring her out to where we are if I put her for a nap in her crib. If she's not in the room with us, he absolutely loses his mind. Hence, why me sleeping in another room with the baby away from him is an issue. Anyways, he absolutely knows that I hate long vehicle rides with the baby. Anything over 40 minutes is far too long. She hates the car and screams the entire time unless I'm sitting right beside her. And frankly, I don't want to sit in the back seat. I get car sick, irritated, I feel unsafe, accident trauma and trapping because you can't open the back door without opening the front door so I can't get out of that vehicle without him letting me out. You name it. I just don't like it, and he knows that. Everything we need is within a 20-minute driving distance. All our family lives within 30 minutes. So we have absolutely zero reason to venture outside of this length of time. But he often tries to push me to. Like last week, he tried to get me to go to some restaurant he wanted to try. And tried convincing me that the 3.5-hour round-trip ride isn't even that bad. No thanks. Well, yesterday he asked me if I wanted to get out of the house and go for a drive with him because he was going to look at a truck. I asked where it was, and he said, just on the other side of Albany. Albany is around 40 minutes from us, so I said, sure. Well, we get past Albany, and it's been like 20 minutes at this point, so an hour total, and I'm getting irritated with being in the back seat, so I ask when we will get there. He checks the GPS and says, 43 minutes. I was pissed. I asked him why he lied and told me it was right on the other side of Albany, and he gave some sad-assed, I thought it was answer, which I do not buy for a single second. It was an hour and 58 minute car ride there, easily 40 minutes that he spent talking to the guy with the truck, just to decide he didn't want it. And then the 2.5 hour drive home, traffic. When we got back home, I immediately grabbed the baby and went to our guest room and locked the door and just went to sleep. It was 8 p.m. I hadn't eaten yet, but I was too pissed to eat. The baby screamed the entire car ride home. Once he realized the door was locked, he started doing his panicked anxiety pacing, saying that I'm overreacting. Saying, don't do this to me. Texted me a bunch of times. When I woke up in the morning, I almost tripped over him because he fell asleep leaning against the door. He says I'm a fucking jerk for doing that, knowing how bad his anxiety is and overdramatic as hell to do so over an uncomfortable car ride. To add, for the record, he knew if he had told me how far away it was, I would have said no and not gone. He has anxiety about going that long without checking on the baby himself, so it was his issue. He even moved to remote work just so he didn't have to leave the baby. As I said, he's in therapy, but no, he refuses medications and doesn't follow the pointers the therapist has suggested to help his anxiety because he can't. Whenever I tell him how much his anxiety is affecting me and the baby's peace, he says, in sickness and health, remember? It won't be like this forever. Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment 1. As I said, he is in therapy, but no, he refuses medications and doesn't follow the pointers the therapist has suggested to help his anxiety because he cannot. Can't means won't. Let him know if he doesn't take medication and or do as his therapist suggests, you and the baby will move out. Not the idiot, but he desperately needs help. P.S. How does he know it won't be like this forever? Your baby is going to grow up, and the worry never stops. Comment 2. So his anxiety needs to be considered, but your baby and your comfort is not. As someone who gets car sick and had a baby scream in the car constantly, I now hate being in a car. He is not considering anyone but himself, and that is a red flag. Now, for the update. Hey everyone, thanks for reading. So, after that whole incident with the truck, things have been tense. My husband and I barely spoke for a couple of days. I was still fuming about the car ride, and he was sulking around the house, clearly upset but not willing to talk about it. I thought maybe some space would help, but it only seemed to make things worse. A few days later, 
I decided to take the baby out for a walk in the stroller to get some fresh air and clear my head. My husband was working from home, as usual, and I figured it would be good for both of us to have some time apart. While I was out, I ran into our neighbor, who mentioned a new mom's group that meets at the local park. She invited me to join them, and I thought it might be a good idea to get some support and meet other moms going through similar experiences. I went to the mom's group the next day, and it was actually really nice. The other moms were friendly, and it felt good to talk to people who understood what I was going through. I even got some tips on how to handle my husband's anxiety and how to help the baby sleep better. I came home feeling a bit more hopeful and decided to share what I had learned with my husband. When I got back, I found him in the living room, pacing and looking more anxious than usual. I tried to talk to him about the mom's group and the advice I had received, but he wasn't interested. He kept interrupting me, saying that he didn't need any more advice and that he was doing the best he could. I could see that he was struggling, but I didn't know how to help him. That night, things took a turn for the worse. The baby was having a particularly fussy night, and my husband was on edge. He kept insisting that the baby needed to be in the room with us, even though I knew she would sleep better in her crib. We ended up having a huge argument, and I said some things I shouldn't have. I told him that his anxiety was ruining our lives, and that I couldn't take it anymore. He looked devastated, and I immediately regretted my words. But the damage was done. The next morning, I woke up to find that my husband had left the house. He didn't leave a note or anything, just disappeared. I tried calling and texting him, but he didn't respond. I was worried sick and didn't know what to do. I called his therapist, who suggested that I give him some space and that he would likely come back when he was ready. For the next few days, I was a wreck. I had to take care of the baby on my own, and I was constantly worried about my husband. I didn't know where he was or if he was okay. I reached out to his family, but they hadn't heard from him either. I felt completely alone and overwhelmed. Finally, after almost a week, he came back. He looked exhausted and disheveled, but he was safe. He told me that he had been staying at a motel and needed some time to think. He apologized for leaving without telling me and said that he realized he needed to take his therapy more seriously. He agreed to try the medication his therapist had recommended and to follow the therapist's advice more closely. I was relieved that he was back and willing to make changes, but things were still far from perfect. His anxiety was still a constant presence in our lives and it was taking a toll on both of us. I tried to be supportive, but I was also struggling with my own feelings of resentment and frustration. One night, while we were trying to get the baby to sleep, my husband broke down. He admitted that he felt like a failure as a father and a husband and that he didn't know how to fix things. I tried to comfort him, but I felt helpless. I didn't know how to make things better, and I was scared that our relationship was falling apart. In the midst of all this, I started to think about my own needs and what I wanted for our family. I realized that I had been so focused on my husband's anxiety that I had neglected my own well-being. I decided to reach out to a therapist for myself hoping that it would help me cope with everything that was going on. As I started therapy, I began to see things more clearly. I realized that I had been enabling my husband's anxiety by constantly accommodating his needs and not setting boundaries. I knew that I needed to take care of myself and the baby, even if it meant making some tough decisions. One evening, I sat down with my husband and told him that things needed to change. I explained that I loved him and wanted to support him, but that I couldn't continue living like this. I told him that he needed to take responsibility for his own mental health and that I would be there to support him, but that I couldn't do it for him. He seemed to understand and for a while things started to improve. He was more committed to his therapy and medication and we were working together to create a more balanced and healthy environment for our family. But then something happened that changed everything. One day I made a mistake that I will always regret. I was exhausted and overwhelmed, and I accidentally left the baby monitor in the living room while I went to take a shower. My husband was in his office, and he didn't hear the baby crying. By the time I realized what had happened, the baby was hysterical, and my husband was in a full-blown panic attack. He accused me of being careless and putting our baby in danger. I tried to explain that it was an accident, but he wouldn't listen. He was convinced that I had done it on purpose to prove a point 
or to punish him for his anxiety. The trust between us was shattered, and I didn't know how to fix it. In the days that followed, things went from bad to worse. My husband became even more anxious and controlling, and I felt like I was walking on eggshells all the time. Our arguments became more frequent and intense, and I started to feel like I was losing myself in the process. I don't know what the future holds for us, but I do know that we can't keep going on like this. I love my husband, but I also need to take care of myself and our baby. I'm hoping that we can find a way to work through this, but I'm also preparing myself for the possibility that we might not be able to. Thanks for reading. Am I the idiot for refusing to give my wife a foot rub on her birthday and causing her to leave? Wife's birthday was on Sunday. On Saturday evening, I planned a birthday party for her at a nice bed and breakfast and invited our friends and family. She had a good time and thanked me for planning a wonderful party. On Sunday, I gifted her jewelry and arranged a cake for her. And I thought that was that. I was also tired from basically staying up that night as I have a client project due this week and was working when my wife was sleeping. So I planned to nap on Sunday to make up for how much I worked and squeezing in the birthday plans. However, after we had brunch, with the birthday cake and all, around 1 p.m., my wife asked me to put lotion on her feet and kiss her neck as her real birthday gift. I said, I'm sorry, honey, not today. I need to sleep. She got upset about this and said I never do the things that she wants for her and thought at least on her own birthday I wouldn't decline. She argued with me and I offered to do it either way, but she said she was too upset about it now. I said I felt like she doesn't appreciate how much I do for her and hope to see an improved attitude from her next time. I was too jaded from that interaction and went to take a hot shower and prepare to sleep in. She was fuming when I came from the bathroom after shower and said she expected me to make it up to her for spoiling her birthday and giving her a lecture when all she wanted was to feel pleasure. I just waved my hand and told her to deal with it and said I was giving her space until she feels better about this and calms down, then went to take a nap. After I woke up after four hours, I could see her eyes were swollen, she had probably cried on the couch this whole time, and I felt bad about dismissing her like that. I said I was sorry for being blunt and making her feel bad today. Although I still wanted us to address that I didn't feel supported at all, and what we could do to understand each other better. However, now she doesn't want to talk to me. It's been a few days and she is still short with me. I don't think it was that big of a deal, and it's a weird hill to die on, to the point you won't even talk to your spouse properly who planned a party for you and gifted you jewelry that she wanted. I feel like she's only looking at things I don't do rather than give me credit and appreciation for things that I do for her. It's really been putting me off from her. To add, she wanted the birthday party. She explicitly asked me to plan it for her. I looked at everything from bed and breakfast to catering and the guest list, and she wanted me to plan it for her. She wanted the jewelry too, she had expressed it months ago that she loved a particular necklace we didn't buy then and was overjoyed when I gifted it to her. The only gift I didn't give to her was foot rubs and intimacy because I was physically exhausted and thought the person I married would understand. Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment one. I just spent two years with someone in a relationship where I would make up for my lack of physical attraction for him by providing all kinds of material stuff. It sucked. And I'm seeing in your post a lot of the same lies I'd tell myself to assuage my guilt over not loving my partner the way he deserved to be loved. Just thought I'd give you a heads up. You know exactly what you're not providing, and those are emotional and physical voids that you cannot fill with money. Comment 2. Dude, you told her not today at 1 p.m. WTF, how long was your nap supposed to be? You gave her material things, but did you give her any affection? There was a much better way to go about this whole thing. How often do you reject her advances? How often does she reject yours? Is there any physical affection in your day-to-day -day life? I feel like we are missing some pieces here. Now, for the update. Thanks for all the comments from the last post. So after my wife's birthday, things got even more complicated. On Monday, I decided to take the day off work to try and make things right. I thought maybe if I showed her I was willing to put in the effort, she'd come around. I made her breakfast in bed, which she barely touched and tried to talk to her, but she just gave me one-word answers. I asked if we could sit down and discuss what happened, but she said she wasn't ready to talk. I felt like I was walking on eggshells around her, 
trying not to make things worse. Later that day, I decided to surprise her by cleaning the house and doing all the chores she usually handles. I thought maybe if she saw I was trying to take some of the load off her, she'd appreciate it. When she came home from running errands, she noticed the clean house but didn't say anything. I asked her if she saw what I did, and she just nodded and went to the bedroom. I followed her and asked if we could talk now, but she said she was tired and needed some space. I felt frustrated and helpless not knowing what else I could do to make things right. On Tuesday, I went back to work, but I couldn't focus. I kept thinking about our argument and how distant she was. During my lunch break, I decided to send her a long text message, apologizing again and explaining how much I loved her and wanted to fix things. I poured my heart out, hoping she'd see how sincere I was. She didn't reply for hours, and when she finally did, all she said was, we'll talk when I'm ready. I felt like I was hitting a brick wall, and it was driving me crazy. That evening, I came home to find her packing a small suitcase. My heart sank, and I asked her where she was going. She said she needed some time away to think and was going to stay with her sister for a few days. I tried to convince her to stay and talk things out, but she was adamant. She said she needed space to clear her head and figure out what she wanted. I felt a mix of anger and sadness, but I didn't want to push her further away, so I let her go. Wednesday was the hardest day. The house felt empty without her, and I couldn't stop replaying our argument in my head. I kept thinking about what I could have done differently. I realized that maybe I had been too dismissive of her feelings, and that my exhaustion wasn't an excuse to ignore her needs. I decided to call my best friend to vent and get some advice. He listened patiently and suggested that I give her the space she asked for, but also show her that I was willing to change and work on our relationship. That night, I sat down and wrote her a heartfelt letter. I apologized for not being there for her when she needed me and acknowledged that I had taken her for granted. I promised to be more attentive and supportive and to work on our communication. I left the letter on her pillow, hoping she'd read it when she came back. Thursday morning, I woke up to a text from her saying she had read the letter and appreciated my honesty. She said she needed a bit more time but was willing to talk when she got back. I felt a glimmer of hope, but I knew we still had a long way to go. As I waited for her to return, I started reflecting on our relationship and how we got to this point. I remembered how we used to be so in sync, always making time for each other and supporting one another. But over the years, life got busier and we both started taking each other for granted. I realized that I had been so focused on my work and other responsibilities that I had neglected her emotional needs I knew I had to make some changes if I wanted to save our marriage. When she finally came back on Friday evening, we sat down and had a long, honest conversation. She told me how hurt she was by my dismissive attitude and how she felt like I didn't appreciate her. I apologized again and told her I was willing to do whatever it took to make things right. We agreed to start couples therapy to work on our communication and rebuild our trust. As we talked, she opened up about some of her own struggles and insecurities that I hadn't been aware of. She told me about how she felt overwhelmed by her responsibilities and how she sometimes felt like she was losing herself in our marriage. I realized that we both had been carrying a lot of unspoken burdens and it was time to start addressing them together. We spent the rest of the weekend reconnecting and trying to rebuild our bond. It wasn't easy and there were still moments of tension but I felt like we were finally on the right track. I knew it would take time and effort, but I was committed to making our marriage work. Thanks for reading. Am I the idiot for feeling insecure about my marriage after my wife's ex reached out to her? So my wife, 28 years old, and I, 30 years old, have been together for 10 years, married for three years. Our intimacy life is pretty much non-existent. We went through some real tough times when we were both studying in our mid-twenties with no money and not much time for each other. This ended up in our intimacy life pretty much dying out, as it's hard to be aroused when you're stressed. Not so much for me, but this is what she has said to me. I've been understanding and supportive as much as I can be. I try to make it about her when we do the deed, lots of foreplay and researching ways that I can make it more enjoyable for her, etc. But she doesn't really seem into it. We have intimacy maybe once every three months, and when we do, I just feel like she can't be bothered. 
She has told me many times in the past that she just doesn't have a high intimacy drive, but then she tells me that she masturbates too, three times a week. She also told me that she and her ex-boyfriend, yes, it was a very long time ago when she was 17, used to have intimacy all the time, but they had no emotional connection. She values our relationship because we have that emotional connection. I have a ridiculously high intimacy drive, so it's pretty tough for me, LOL. I don't actually care that she masturbates, but it makes me feel like she's lying about having a low intimacy drive. This makes me feel like I'm just not good enough and she's not attracted to me. I keep myself pretty fit and well-groomed. I work hard to bring in money to pay the mortgage and support her emotionally. Trying to set a good foundation for being a good husband, but still doesn't seem to make her attracted to me. Am I being a sensitive little witch or is something off here? To add, I satisfy her easily with clitoral stimulation during foreplay. My cunnilingus techniques have gotten pretty good as a result of me trying to learn better ways to pleasure her. I honestly just think that she isn't sexually attracted to me anymore and don't want to admit that it's a lost cause. I really just need an intimacy connection. And yes, I have spoken to her many times about my needs. Now for an update. Wow, thanks for all the positive feedback from everyone. I was half expecting to be dragged for being a simp. I can't respond anymore as there are too many comments and messages for me to keep up with, but I really appreciate all the help. This obviously resonates with a lot of people and makes me realize that people need to talk about this more. I wish I knew about intimacy compatibility much earlier because I think I'm just chasing the sunk cost fallacy. Sounds like she just needs someone who makes her aroused and I need someone who actually wants to connect with me sexually. Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment one. I have a much higher intimacy drive than my husband, but honestly, most of the time I end up having to finish myself because he can be pretty selfish, not on purpose, during intimacy. And it has turned me off from wanting to have intimacy with him as much. I'm not saying that's why your wife is, but it would be good to start that conversation no matter how uncomfortable it may be. There's not enough information to know who's at fault here, but I agree with previous advice on a intimacy therapist, or at the very least, a conversation. The only thing worse than no intimacy is intimacy where only one partner experiences the majority of the pleasure and doesn't bother to attend to their partner's needs. Comment two, people self-intimacy for different reasons. Some do it purely out of pleasure, some do it because it's stress relieving and some do it out of boredom. So intimacy isn't the same as masturbation and a low intimacy drive isn't the same as not self-intimacy. What you should really think about is, are you okay with it staying this way? You asked her many times it seems and she hasn't changed anything. And at this point she won't. You can't change her. She needs to do that. And if she doesn't want to, then she doesn't want to. So you either suck it up or get yourself someone that can match your intimacy drive, not the idiot for feeling the way that you do. Now for the update. Hey everyone, thanks for all the comments and support from the last post. So two weeks ago, I decided to have another serious talk with my wife about our intimacy life. I told her how I felt about everything, from her self-intimacy to her past with her ex-boyfriend. She seemed to understand where I was coming from, but she also looked really stressed out. She admitted that she felt pressured and that it made her even less interested in intimacy. I felt bad, but I also needed to be honest about my feelings. A few days after our talk, I noticed she was acting differently. She was more distant and seemed to be avoiding me. I tried to give her space, thinking maybe she needed time to process everything. But then one night, I found her crying in the living room. She told me she felt like a failure as a wife because she couldn't meet my needs. That hit me hard. I realized that my constant pushing might have been making things worse for her. We decided to try couples therapy. Our first session was eye-opening. The therapist helped us see that our issues were deeper than just intimacy. We had communication problems and unresolved feelings from our past. My wife opened up about how her parents' divorce when she was a teenager had affected her. She said she always felt like she had to be perfect to keep people from leaving her, this made her put up walls, even with me. I also shared my own struggles. I talked about how my parents always fought and how I promised myself I would never have a relationship like theirs. I realized that I was so focused on being the perfect husband that I didn't see how my actions were affecting my wife. The therapist suggested we work on rebuilding our emotional connection before focusing on the physical aspect of our relationship. 
In the meantime, I started noticing some changes at home. My wife was making an effort to be more affectionate. She would hold my hand while we watched TV and give me hugs for no reason. It felt nice, but I still missed the intimacy connection. I tried to be patient, reminding myself that this was a process. Then, something unexpected happened. My wife's ex-boyfriend reached out to her on social media. She told me about it right away, which I appreciated. She said he just wanted to catch up and see how she was doing. I felt a pang of jealousy, but tried to trust her. She assured me that she had no interest in rekindling anything with him. A few days later, she showed me a message he had sent her. He apologized for how he treated her when they were together and said he regretted not valuing their emotional connection. My wife seemed relieved to hear this, like it gave her some closure. But it also made me worry. What if she started comparing me to him again? Around this time, I started noticing some changes in myself too. I was less focused on intimacy and more on just enjoying our time together. I realized that I had been so obsessed with our lack of intimacy that I was missing out on other aspects of our relationship. We started doing more things together, like cooking dinner and going for walks. It felt like we were reconnecting in a way we hadn't in years. But then, another issue came up. My wife found out that her job was downsizing and she might lose her position. This added a whole new layer of stress to our lives. She was worried about our financial situation and what it would mean for her career. I tried to be supportive, but I could see the toll it was taking on her. One night after a particularly stressful day, she broke down and told me she felt like everything was falling apart. She said she felt like she was failing in every aspect of her life, including our marriage. I held her and told her we would get through it together. It was a raw and emotional moment, but it also brought us closer. As we continued therapy, we started to uncover more about our pasts and how they shaped our present. My wife talked about how her parents' constant fighting made her afraid of conflict. She said she often avoided talking about her feelings because she didn't want to start an argument. This made me realize that I needed to be more patient and understanding I also shared more about my own fears. I admitted that I was afraid of ending up like my parents, stuck in a loveless marriage. The therapist helped us see that we were both carrying a lot of baggage from our past and that we needed to work through it together. In the midst of all this, my wife got some good news. Her company decided to keep her on, but in a different role. It was a relief, but it also meant more changes for us. She would be working longer hours and traveling more. We talked about how we would handle this new dynamic and agreed to make an effort to stay connected. As we navigated these changes, I started to see some improvements in our relationship. We were communicating better and being more open with each other. The physical aspect of our relationship was still a work in progress, but I felt hopeful for the first time in a long time. One night, after a particularly good therapy session, my wife surprised me. She initiated intimacy for the first time in months. It wasn't perfect, but it felt like a step in the right direction. We both agreed that we still had a lot of work to do, but it was a positive sign. Looking back, I can see how far we've come in just two weeks. We've faced some tough challenges, but we've also made some important breakthroughs. I know we still have a long way to go, but I feel more optimistic about our future. Thanks for reading. If you like this video, you'll probably like these too. Also, while you're here, please consider subscribing. It's your support that keeps this channel alive and allows me to make better and longer videos. Have a great day.